From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Shanali Basak and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, economic data is starting to weaken. Plus, the U.S. consumer sentiment falls for the first time in months. And yet another big investor warns of no rate cuts this year. But we begin with the big issue, the Fed's handle on inflation. January is a bad month. We're seeing a lot of January effects in the data. To me, the overall story is still the same. We're moving in the right direction on inflation. It's coming down. It's making progress. We have a period of disinflation in front of us. We are on track to start getting cuts later this year. We know the Fed's going to cut. It's not so much when it starts, it's how many we're going to get. We're in this process of capitulation. And the markets come around thinking the average is going to be more like three cuts. The Fed is just continuing to tell us data dependency, and we are watching that data. I wouldn't be surprised to see things like March, April core inflation come in weaker than expected. Come Q2, uh, we're going to see all of those beginning of the year effects fading. Talk to me in the spring. Now let's start by looking at the two-year yield because you've seen some massive movements here. You've seen a more than 20 basis point move from peak to trough over the course of this week. Remember, beginning the week, looking at inflation data that was coming in a little hotter than expected, driving yields past 470 on the week, and then falling now below at one point today, 453 on the day, now around 455. You saw it starting to drop off even more when we saw some data cooling from the U.S. consumer here, sentiment low, according to University of Michigan expectations, and then some more sentiments from Fed governors warning about the balance sheet roll-off of the Federal Reserve as well, watching that pace of the yield drop even quickening. But let's look at the U.S. inflation data, because this is where the rubber really hits the road on expectation for rate cuts and how much lower yields can really go. We looked at that consumer price index coming in above expectations. That was what sent the initial jitters into the market. Then you're watching the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation here, the PCE deflator. We're looking at personal consumption indexes here meeting expectations but still rising at the fastest levels in a year so you can see why the Fed is not in a rush to lower interest rates at this point now San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly spoke this week with Bloomberg and said the Fed is at the ready but that there's no urgent need to cut rates we want to avoid holding on all the way to 2% they're putting policy very tight and then cause an unnecessary downturn we are agile and we're sitting in what I call the ready position. We are ready to make moves and adjust as the data demand us to do. And I think right now the economy and policy are in a good place to do that. Now joining us now is All Springs, George Bory and Peter Cicchini of Exonic Capital. George, you're looking at slightly softer data in some areas of the economy, but how much does data need to weaken for the Fed to start cutting rates? You, you make a great point, and this, uh, you know, kind of the lead up to to the discussion kind of really hits the nail on the head. And it's it's about pace, and it's about confirmation. And in terms of pace, you know, what the Fed has done is kind of pushed out expectations, uh, and they really are set to, they're telling us in no uncertain terms they need some validation that the trend, the downward trend in inflation is still in place. And like you just pointed out, it would tell you that sort of inflation's kind of stalled in here, and we're going to need to see sort of further true evidence that while there might be a pause or a stall as we kind of rolled into the new year, that those disinflationary trends are actually reinserting ourselves, reinserting themselves. So we think, you know, whether it's it's going to be labor, it's going to be housing, it's going to be the ultimate, you know, the, the, the end game in terms of the actual inflation data itself. But but that really kind of pushes, we think, you know, kind of the, the, the realistic point in time is, is really kind of getting out to that June time frame. So about three months of data to sort of reinforce that the trend is, is clearly in place. So that, that's what a lot of the rhetoric tells us. You know, they, they are not stepping away from, from the notion that the next move is most likely to be down not up, uh, but they, they want to see evidence that the structural downtrend has been confirmed. Now, it's interesting. Even just this week, you had David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman, saying that investors should see some uncertainty around soft landing expectations. Peter, there's a question about how soon data will start to soften, but there's another question on how much the data will soften. Do you think that it could get worse than people expect? <laughs> 
You know, in fact, I think when you look at something like Fed funds futures and and what what uh, was implied uh, in terms of of cuts versus what is now currently being implied, um, you know, 160 basis points to now let's call it 80 basis points. Uh, that was a January versus now. I think the real question is not whether the Fed cuts; it's the reason the Fed feels like it must cut. Um, and, you know, we're starting to see in the high frequency data, we're, we're starting to see a weakening in employment. The, IN, the ISM subcomponent for employment this morning, I believe, was at about uh, 45 for manufacturing. Uh, we got a services employment print that was at 43. Uh, the print before last uh, bounced up just back above 50. Um, that said, uh, you know, the, the data over time has been rolling over. Um, especially in employment, continuing claims are beginning to pick up as well. And so it can happen very quickly um, all at once, especially when you see the kind of complacency that we have uh, right now. There can be, you know, concerted market reactions versus um, versus expectations. And I kind of think that's where we are. I believe it's the second half as well. Um, and I do believe we're going to see the data weaken very quickly in the second half of the year. Now, you still have uh, the greater portion of investors believing that rate cuts will come this year and rate cuts will come as early as this summer. But you have Apollo's Torsten Slock, on the other hand, writing that the reality is that the U.S. economy is just simply not slowing down. And the Fed pivot has provided a strong tailwind to growth since December. And as a result, the Fed will not cut rates this year and rates are going to stay higher for longer. George, how caught off guard would investors be if they do not see that rate cut this year? Well, I think not only investors, but I think the Fed. The Fed is, is clearly signal that they intend to cut rates. But there's a very valid point that, you know, it, it takes both time and, and ultimately sort of effort to, to get inflation back down to target and sort of the move much lower from here, but we, we've expected kind of a, a sticky and somewhat stubborn inflation trajectory that's moving lower, you know, slowly um, and organically. But if if we truly need to get down to target, that's that's probably going to need you know sort of slower growth uh, or or weaker growth uh, as well to to would accompany that and. The economy is doing better than, than expected and, and is showing signs of, of strength and, and has been doing reasonably well. So there is an argument to say that they may not do anything this year. The trajectory would suggest perhaps that that's a strong statement, um, but 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 it's possible. Um, and, and I think the, the market would get caught off guard if, if the Fed had to pivot back towards uh, kind of neutral or back towards a tightening policy, that would certainly catch the market off guard. Uh, but an extended pause, uh, in, in our opinion, it would be uncomfortable. There would be volatility, not convinced that that would necessarily, um, you know, truly shock the market. There's still a nearly 40 percent chance that they do not cut this summer, according to Fed futures yeah. as well. And Peter, if you look at financial conditions and where they stand, we are still talking about a week of record credit issuance. We're talking about Bitcoin at record highs. There are plenty of investors out there who would say that there is just no discipline in this market and that could send all sorts of prices higher. How do you feel about that view? Well, I'm not going to pull any punches here. Um, you know, for months, uh, Chairman Powell had been talking about financial conditions easing um, at, at successive meetings last year uh, prior to December. Uh, he pushed back on looser financial conditions as a reason to stay on course, to get the job done, uh, sort of invoking his inner Paul Volcker. Um, some, for some reason, in December, uh, perhaps on the, peel, uh, the heels of Janet Yellen saying that real rates were high enough to tighten financial conditions, um, he completely punted during that press conference in December anytime asked about financial conditions. I've been jokingly calling it the Bernsian pivot. Um, and, you know, as a result, we have seen a concerted loosening of financial conditions, a rally in risk asset markets, and the reflexive uh, consequence of that is that inflation now, uh, which was on a real disinflationary trend, seems now to have picked up a bit. Um, and in addition, there are you know things that happen with the lag, like COLA adjustments. If we look at the personal income data from January, um, I believe it was up 1%. Um, and so there are still inflationary forces at play mm -hmm. that stronger financial conditions or stronger asset markets, pardon me, 
um, and lose their financial conditions uh, aren't going to help. So I'm going to offer one reason here. I spoke earlier this week with Sixth Street's Alan Waxman about the Fed's balance sheet and managing the 10-year. Let's take a quick listen to what he had to say. The Fed has done a very good job. They've been very smart with respect to their management of the 10-year Treasury. Like, if you look at their balance sheet, they've ma been managing down the risk. They've kept the short end of the curve high. But 10 years, which finances a lot of the investment grade companies, which a big part of the job universe, uh, by the way, ha have all fixed rate debt, those holdings have actually gone up. So in the face of the Fed shrinking balance sheet, that is the one part of the market where they've actually kept the balance sheet. In fact, they actually grown the balance sheet. George, we talk so much about high interest rates, but we don't talk enough about the Fed's balance sheet. Do you think it's the Fed's balance sheet that is keeping conditions loose? Uh, I think it's it's I think it's it's well, we think it's it's really more of a, a coincident factor that they they continue to drain liquidity out of the system and trying to absorb excess liquidity, and and largely driven by you know kind of the balance sheet reduction. So. I think there's a lot of fine tuning here that we're talking about and some very, very specific points along the curve. And the Fed does have some degree of control uh, from that perspective. But balance sheet management, in, in our opinion, has gone reasonably well, uh, can, can create some pressure points as we've seen in the past and may do so again in the future. But by and large, to the extent the economy holds up, that liquidity conditions hold up, the Fed is basically kind of rebuilding its own reserves, if mm -hmm. you will as it draws down the balance sheet, because quite simply, the economy doesn't need it right now. And there's no reason to um, kind of push that excess liquidity into the system. Peter, really quickly here, do you think if the Fed starts to really get their pedal on the balance sheet reduction to a greater degree that we could see a tantrum? Um, you know, I don't I don't think that's likely. And that's because my review, my views for weaker economy later in the year. And so I think a flight quality will keep the long end in check. And moreover, look, the big the big difference, and we haven't touched on it, it, it this time in this cycle, is fiscal policy. And of course, coupon issuance um, would argue for higher long yields, um, and that's and that is certainly a risk. Um, but all of that said, at the end of the day, what will control the long end of the curve, in our view at Exonic, is a slower economy into the end of the year and a bid for duration. George Borey and Peter Cicchini, certainly duration has been a big question this year. Now, up next, we're going to talk about the auction block because investment-grade U.S. companies have borrowed around $400 billion already this year. We're going to dig into this red-hot market. Stick with us. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the auction block, where bond sales are off to a historic start to the year. We start in Europe because the primary bond market was seeing year-to-date volume passing 500 billion euros in the shortest time ever. Investors putting in a record 2.6 trillion euros of orders on those sales, creating the highest ratio ever. In U.S. high-grade, sales this week from names like Aon, Honeywell, and HSBC smashed records for February issuance. There was nearly $200 billion sold for the month. The record streak could stop, however, as the records for the next few months were set during the pandemic and will therefore be hard to break. And over in U.S. high yield, with still a full month to go, we have already topped the first quarter volume that we saw in 2022 and 2023. Issuance now stands at nearly $58 billion year to date. Now, sticking with credit, Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites weighs in on where spreads are now and where they're heading. Credit spreads are still super resilient. And I think that speaks to the technical backdrop where investors have been really underinvested, under allocating to credit risk, and now they're kind of holding their nose and having to play catch up. I think you can safely assume that high yield spreads are going to widen at least some. I don't know the magnitude because there would be cash coming out of the front end, out of money market funds and into the fixed income markets. But you would assume that defaults would rise. Now let's bring in Sonali Pierre, Portfolio Manager for High Yield and Multi-Sector Credit at PIMCO, and Danielle Polly, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager for Global Credit Strategy at Oak Tree Capital. Danielle, when you see how tight spreads have been, where do you find value here? Well, Sonali, while spreads have been tight, all in yields are quite attractive. There's an opportunity to get high single digit, even double digit yields. And so shifting that thinking from spread to yield, I think makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider some of the other factors in the high yield market. 
like the fact that bonds are trading um, at a decent price today, well below par. So there is some potential upside um, as well. And generally, it's a higher quality market than it was. You know, for where we are in this cycle, I think we're seeing that defaults have been relatively low. Borrowers have been able to weather where we are. And if you're a credit picker like we are, we think that there's ample performing companies that are going to pay us back on those loans. Now, how do you feel, Sonali, as the data, the economic data starts to weaken here? Do you get a little worried about some sectors, particularly the ones that are more levered to the consumer? That's right. So I think, you know, overall for high yield, we're quite constructive. We think there's a lot of opportunity as yields have risen to generate that income, predictability, and resilience in fixed income. That said, as we look to some of the lower quality portions of high yield, even though the asset class has improved over the last decade and it is looking relatively strong, um, you know, there are some areas uh, where we're concerned. So, for example, in some of the very cyclical issuers where, you know, interest coverage um, is starting to shrink, especially in some cases in the bank loan market um, or in sectors uh, which are in secular decline, right? So areas like wireline, retail, where there's just a lot less resilience and therefore um, may be more difficult with low multiples and low margins to weather any sort of uh, disruption. Well, it's interesting because the risk rally in triple C bonds have really been the best performing asset class in February when you think about it. But interestingly, Danielle, too, you look at HYG, for example, and you see outflows that were quite meaningful here. How do you handle that? Do you also start to take some chips off the table in places where you see lower credits or do you start to be greedy where others are fearful? I think that's the right question to be asking. And I think a lot of investors reached into risk in the fourth quarter. And you're right, triple C's really rallied. We tend to be more conservative and don't feel that we need to stretch for that risk, especially in a multi-asset construct. Our global credit strategy has a mix of not only high yield bonds and senior loans, but we're able to extend and reach into CLOs. CLOs are an interesting investment opportunity because it's a diversified pool of loans where you're getting paid a premium above similarly rated debt. And we think that those yields are quite attractive. CLOs are also a stable borrower base for loans. So instead of taking triple C rated high yield risk, why not increase in quality, go into the CLO market and get an instrument that's going to be more loss remote over a cycle? You know, it's interesting, Sonali, when you think about how excited banks are to get from that record issuance from investment grade over to high yield and even leveraged loans, the bank loan market you're talking about here, do you think that new issuers uh, should expect the same sort of rosy reception for the next few months, especially as we may not see rate cuts as quick as expected, more things starting to break a little? I think it depends on, one, how much is coming to market, so what are the options? Uh, that investors can choose from, as well as the quality of what's coming to market. So, I mean, there are many times at PIMCO we're providing dual track pricing, for example, for a public deal as well as a private deal and what the terms we would like to see on those. So I think really it just increases the ability to be selective and active in our selection of which new issues we'll participate, what format we'd participate, and again, in that multi-sector diversified income approach, um, you know, we have the ability to go across asset classes so we're not segmented by market structure and you know we can really look at where the best relative value is globally. Well speaking of are the banks able to really start to outbid the private markets here there was that strong bid when you think of the private credit markets but now you're seeing the banks starting to compete. Yeah absolutely right um, more and more people are looking at private credit as an area to be able to compete in but I think what's important is sort of one um, you know the credit quality so that due diligence aspect Two is, um, you know, what is the expertise you're bringing in there? So, for example, when we look at it, uh, you know, I think that the overall, the leveraged finance as an asset class across high yields, bank loans, private credit has grown tremendously. And that's good for both issuers and investors um, standing at over four and a half trillion today. It's now more a question of structure, covenants, uh, you know, where we think that credit is going and where we want to be investing our incremental dollars. I want to move to a sector that a lot of people are watching now as well. Danielle, when you look at the, the financial sector here, people mm -hmm. are thinking a lot about New York Community Bank and the troubles that it's seen. And it's interesting, you saw a, a bond here that was trading at par fall to about 74 cents on the dollar, jump back above 80, and then today jump back below that 
that level. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, when you see kind of these jitters in the property market, in the regional banking system, how do you view that opportunity? And is it even an opportunity? So I think these pockets of volatility can create opportunities, especially to go in and buy credits that are high quality at discounted prices. You know, we've seen the regional banking crisis spread, at least in terms of volatility, into other credits previously when that happened. And I think, again, it might create a more favorable market for investors like Oak Tree that are more contrarian and tend to go into these times with the expectation that they can get some good bargains and hold for the long term. I do feel like the market has been pricing in this unexpected scenario in our view that there's going to be significant rate cuts in the face of a strong economy and growth. And there's probably going to be some volatility ahead as that may not materialize. And you do have flare ups in regional banks or other geopolitical events that could occur. Sonali Pierre and Danielle Pauly, we have to leave it there, but certainly a big week in credit and still a lot of questions ahead on where spreads go. And still ahead, the final spread. The week ahead, another key payrolls report is coming out. Big moment for investors. Stick with us. We'll talk about all those expectations. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the final spread, the week ahead. Coming up, it's a big week. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker kicking off another busy week of Fed speak. Then voters across the United States hitting the polls for Super Tuesday, plus global PMA buys rollout. Wednesday, Fed Chair Powell testifies in the House, followed by the Senate on Thursday, then an ECB decision, and finally a read on the U.S. labor market with the latest payrolls report. And let's look at those expectations, because there is an expectation that the labor market is cooling with an estimated 190k additions in jobs way softer than you saw from the prior print of 353 but still well above what Jerome Powell has said would be the neutral pace here of payroll so let's keep an eye on all that the unemployment rate expected to stay unchanged but that does it from New York from us same time same place next week this was real yields on Bloomberg this is Bloomberg